Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we are now in our fourth lesson um, of circular motion and gravitation. And in this lesson, we're gonna talk all about something called gravitational fields. So, um, uh, scientists really struggled with this idea that objects can exert forces on each other without actually coming in contact. And so you can think of this as for example, gravity, but also magnets or electric uh, of repulsion and attraction. And so this is kind of a really weird concept. And so what, what they developed is this idea of um, object can be surrounded by fields. When you find a field as an area of influence. And so you could imagine that the earth is surrounded by a gravitational field, magnets are surrounded by magnetic fields, protons are surrounded by electric fields, and so on. And so one of the ways to visualize this is to maybe think of a campfire. You could think of a campfire as being surrounded by a heat field, although I'm not sure there is such a real thing. And so if you were to get closer to the fire, that you would notice the strength would increase. So the closer you are, to the, the thing that's emitting the field, the stronger the field seems to be. And if you were to increase the size of the fire, then again, the strength would increase. So just like um, this so-called heat field, um, if we have gravitational fields surrounding any object with mass, that gravitational field is gonna depend on one, how close you are to it, and two, uh, how, how large that object is. In this case, how massive it is. And we're gonna come back to this idea of fields again and again when we look at electromagnetism later. So you might think about protons being surrounded by electric fields. Well, if you have two or three or five or 20 protons, those might be surrounded by stronger and stronger fields. And so <clears throat> just, like, um, just like the heat field, gravitational fields surround the Earth, um, fields can either be vector or scalar, and so a gravitational field is a force field, which means it is a vector. So it's an area surrounding an object, but it also has a direction. And so we don't really think about the direction of gravitational fields uh, it, all that much. What I mean to say is it's kind of obvious, because gravity, again, is a little bit strange in that it always works to attract. So if the Earth is surrounded by uh, a gravitational field, we know that that's going to be a gravitational field that's working down towards the Earth because it's a gravity is always going to work to attract things. We'll see later if you think about that example of electric fields. Well, protons might um, attract electrons, but they're going to repel other protons, and so there must be like uh, different directions that fields can work in. But for gravity, for now at least, things are nice and simple. It's always going to work towards the object. Now, if you think about the these lines, these uh, field lines, these arrows, they're representing the, the field itself. And the density of the arrows represents the magnitude of the field strength. So the more closely packed those lines are, the stronger the field is going to be. And I keep talking about gravitational field as though you haven't heard of it before, but in actual fact, it's a dear friend of yours from Physics um, 11 that you know and love called the acceleration due to gravity. So gravitational field and acceleration due to gravity are the same thing because while mass tends to create a gravitational field, mass also tends to accelerate in a gravitational field. So the acceleration of objects on Earth are due to its gravitational field. So we know that Fg equals mg and so that means that g is just Fg over m. And we know that this g value is um, our acceleration due to gravity, it's also our gravitational field strength, and on Earth it's approximately 9.8 newtons per kilogram. But notice that um, to find the g value, we say the g value would be the force of gravity felt by a test mass in that field. And what we mean is, if you were to take a one kilogram mass and stick it near the Earth's gravitational field, then you could measure the weight of that object and then you could divide by the mass and that would tell you the strength of that field. And so that works fine if we kind of know what the g value is, but it's going to be more useful for us to come up with um, another formula that we can kind of use anywhere. So we know that fg equals mg, but we also saw in the last video that g, uh, fg equals gm1m2 over r squared. And if we kind of stick with the convention that mass 1 is the planet 
or the thing making the field, and mass 2 is the object in the field, you might recognize that this mass over here, this is mass 2, and so I can cancel those masses out because um, they're not actually going to affect the strength of the field, and so I end up with g is equal to g times m1 divided by r squared. And so the strength of a field really only depends on one object. You only need one thing to have a field, but you need two things to have a force. So you can have the Earth surrounded by a gravitational field. A force isn't felt until an object goes into that field. So your mass in this field will experience a force, but on its own the field can still exist. So let's look at a few examples. What's the gravitational field strength on the surface of the moon? Well, we've got our fancy new formula. So G equals G M1 over R squared. And um, remember that in this case, the radius of the moon is our separation. Because if we're looking for the, the strength on the surface, the radius of the moon will be the separation distance. So G will equal 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Uh, times the mass of the moon, 7.35 times 10 to the 22, all divided by 1.74 times 10 to the 6, and all of that has to be squared. Okay. Cool. So we get a value of right around 1.62. Now, gravitational field strength, of course, can be measured in meters per second squared because we know it's an acceleration. But just a reminder that we saw that gravitational field strength is the force of gravity divided by mass. So a meter per second squared must be the same thing as a newton per kilogram. Those are the exact same units. So for whatever reason, when things are accelerating, we tend to use their acceleration in meters per second squared. And when we talk about gravitational field strength, we often just talk about newtons per kilogram. So a satellite orbits the Earth at a radius of that value. Let's see if we can relate this back to um, circular motion. What is the um, orbital period? So I've got a, a planet here and then a satellite, and by a planet I mean the Earth. I forgot the name there for a second. So the R value is 2.20 times 10 to the 7. Now, <clears throat> um, we kind of saw an example of this in the last video, but I think this is important to take a look at here because you might say, okay, well I know that FC is going to equal FG. But what does that have to do with gravitational field? Well, centripetal acceleration, uh, centripetal force is just mass times centripetal acceleration, and the force of gravity is just mass times the gravitational field. So again, since gravitational field is an acceleration, you can see that the masses here of the satellite cancel out, and what we have is the centripetal acceleration must just be equal to the acceleration due to gravity which is sort of what we saw in the last video. But let's just take this a step further. I'm looking now for the orbital period, not the speed. So my formula for centripetal acceleration that involves orbital period, uh, sorry, that involves, yeah, period, is four pi squared r divided by t squared. And I know my value for g is g m one over r squared. Now, we're looking for period t, and I just want to point this out because it's really tempting at this point right here to jump in and say, look, I've got an r on this side here, and I've got an r squared on that side. It sure would be nice if I could cancel those out, but let's just see what happens when we do the algebra. If I want to um, get rid of my denominator, so I'm going to multiply both sides by t squared, multiply by t squared to move that denominator, and I'm actually going to also multiply by r squared to get rid of these denominators. So I'm getting, moving both those denominators. What I end up with is I end up with r squared here times another r. So r squared times r doesn't cancel out. They actually, um, they're gonna work together. So I got four pi squared r cubed is equal to g m t squared. And now finishing off my algebra here, I have to divide by g m, and so I get t squared equals four pi squared r cubed over gm, which means t is equal to the square root of 4 pi squared times r cubed, all divided by g times m. So the orbital period is actually proportional 
um, the square of the orbital period, I should say, is proportional to the cube of the separation distance. It's not quite as simple a relationship as it was for speed. Okay, so I'm going to put all these values into my calculator and see what I get. And uh, I am not going to write them out because I don't have enough space, but that's okay. So... Okay, and then of course, don't forget, I need to take the square root of that whole thing. And I get, uh, let's see, 32,500 seconds is the orbital period. Okay, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about orbits just a little bit more. I wanna talk about something called geosynchronous orbit. So if I have a, um, a satellite, I can tell that the orbital speed of the satellite is going to depend on the strength of the gravitational field. And, um, and that's really just going to depend on the orbital radius. So the closer I am to a planet, the faster I go, and so on. So satellite A orbits the Earth at twice the orbital radius of satellite B. So imagine here I've got the Earth, and then I've got satellite A. Okay, here's satellite A, and here's satellite B. Um, which one is traveling faster in each case? Well, I can see that satellite A is, tra is going to be traveling faster because it is closer. So the force of gravity on A is larger, therefore it needs to travel faster. And if it doesn't travel faster, well then the force of gravity might be so strong that it just pulls the satellite straight into Earth and it crash lands. Now this comparison though is satellite A is going to orbit the sun. So here's the sun. I can't even draw the sun. It's too big. And here's the Earth. And so I've got satellite A is going to orbit the sun at the same orbital radius that satellite B orbits the Earth. Okay, so those radii are the same. And so which one is going to be faster? And again, we can see that it's going to be satellite A that's going to be faster because, again, the force of gravity on A is larger. Therefore, it is faster. So the stronger the, the gravitational field, the faster you need to go to uh, stay in orbit. And then, so the orbital period of the satellite is going to depend on the mass of the planet and the orbital radius of the satellite, which is what we saw back here in this previous example. And so it stands to reason that the closer you are to uh, the Earth, say, the faster you need to travel, and the further away you are, the slower you can travel, then you might be able to get a satellite where the orbital period will perfectly match the rotational period of the planet. And that satellite would be something that we call geosynchronous or geostationary. So think about what that means. If it takes the satellite the same amount of time to go around the Earth as it takes the Earth to spin around, well, what would that look like from the Earth's perspective? What that would mean is when you look up, if you could look up and see that satellite, it's moving around the Earth at the same rate that you're rotating on the Earth. and so it would look like it's standing still. It's not, it would be moving very quickly, but it would stay above the same point on Earth. And so that's what we mean by geosynchronous or geostationary. So if I have my Earth here, and I have a satellite, what is the point, what is the radius that this could orbit at where my orbital uh, period is the same as the rotational period? And so I guess what I'm saying is what would, it take for it to have a period of exactly 24 hours. Now, um, I can't use 24 hours, so I'll just multiply that by uh, 60 minutes in one hour, and then multiply it by 60 seconds in one minute to get um, seconds.
And so I have 86,400 seconds. So how far away must this be? Well, I've got my formula. I know that AC is going to equal G. And so I know that, um, that 4 pi squared R over T squared is going to equal uh, G M 1 over R squared. And now in this case, I guess what I'm solving for is I'm solving for R. And so what I get is, if I do some algebra, I get R cubed would be equal to G M 1 T squared over 4 pi squared. And I'll just take the cube root of both sides to uh, the cube root of both sides to solve that. And so I get R is going to equal the cube root of G M1 T squared over 4 pi squared. Okay. And so uh, the cube root function is kind of, if you're not aware, is hiding in this little math window on your, on your calculator. You can go down and you can use that cube root function there. And so I'm going to do 6.67. Uh, times 10 to the negative 11. I'm going to multiply that by the mass of the earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24. And I'm going to multiply that times the, the period, 86,400 seconds squared. And I'm going to divide this whole thing by 4 times pi squared. Whew, that is a mess. And I get an answer of uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, about 42 million uh, meters. So I've got 4.2, let's just see that again, 4.23, and I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, 42, say, times 10 to the 7 meters away. So any um, satellite that uh, is placed in geostationary orbit around the Earth anyways, as long as it's at a radius of 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters, then it can be geostationary. I will point out though that it does have to be above the Earth's equator. So to have a proper geostationary orbit, it has to be above the Earth's equator. And I'll let you think about why that is. Why, why would you have to be above the equator? Why couldn't you be uh, in some other orbit around the Earth. Now to find the speed of the satellite, I guess I could go and use the other formula for um, centripetal force and all that, but I don't want to. Anything moving in a circle at a constant speed has a speed of 2 pi r over t. And so if I know the r value, so 2 times pi times my r value, 4.2 times 10 to the 7, all divided by 86,400, and this will give me my speed. So 2 times pi times 4.2 times 10 to the 7 divided by 86,400. So 2 times pi times 4.2 times 10 to the 7 divided by 86,400. And I get right around just over three kilometers a second. Three point, yeah, let's just call it three zero five zero meters per second. Okay, and that would be the speed. All right, that is it for um, gravitational fields.